All right, good afternoon, folks, wherever you are morning for some of you. Uh, just gonna get everyone a few minutes to log in and check in and get relaxed for this conversation on democratizing clinical trial. We have um, moderating this panel is our very own Christina Edwards who's been working in this space for, uh, a, a, she's, she's too young, but it's, it's been a, a long enough time in this space. So without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Christina. Remember, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. And if you just wanna comment along, please put it in the chat section and we'll keep it going. All right, everyone, I'm turning it over to Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, today's title, we have Democratizing Clinical Trials with a Community First Approach. Thank you, Brandon, Brandon for the introduction. Um, again, the Q&A chat is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, so please enter your questions there and we will try to answer them at the end of the discussion. Um, so a little overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, clinical trials, diversity in clinical trials, or lack thereof. Um, so clinical trials, as you know, can provide patients with early access to cutting edge medicines under close medical supervision, of course, yet the majority still do not reflect the increased diversity and complexity of the U.S. and global populations. Um, we don't see that those that participate in those trials doesn't necessarily reflect um, the actual percentage of the population that exists and the diversity in that population. So during this call, we'll discuss our latest efforts, um, that being PPD Thermo Fisher Scientific and National Minority Quali Quality Forum to disrupt the traditional approach to clinical research and build capacity in communities that are historically underserved to ensure greater equity and access to care. Um, again, myself, Christina Edwards, I am the Clinical Trial Director in the at the National Minority Quality Forum Center for Clinical and Social Research. I'll be the moderator today. I'm going to introduce my colleague also at NMQF, Dr. Salvatore Aleshi, the Senior Vice President at the Center for Clinical and Social Research. And then we have from Thermo Fisher Scientific, Lauren Hubbard, the Director of Patient Diversity, and Forrester Rockwell, Director of Enterprise Learning. Um, so some of you may or may not be aware or have seen, we announced yesterday, uh, Thursday, September 7th, a collaboration between Thermo Fisher Scientific and the National Minority Quality Forum, Forum excuse me, um, to make research more accessible to historically underserved communities and patient populations through NMQS Alliance for Representative Clinical Trials. Uh, we'll be referring to, referring to it to ARC uh, for short, ARC. Um, Alliance for Representative Clinical Trials, and we'll do a deeper eye dive into ARC throughout this webinar. Um, so that press release went out yesterday, so hopefully you all, if you have not seen it, you should be able to access that um, starting yesterday. Um, so a little high-level overview about this collaboration. So Thurma Fisher's clinical research business and NMQF we are helping to build the capacity of community health clinics to participate in clinical trials. The collaboration integrates ARC clinics into the clinical research process through comprehensive training, ongoing participation as investigator, investigator sites in clinical trials. The collaboration also supports biopharmaceutical and biotech customers in meeting regulatory expectations to enroll, and retain patients in clinical trials who more fully reflect the real world populations experiencing the disease or health conditions being studied, including the US FDA requirements around diversity action plans. Um, the collaboration also reflects Thermo Fisher and NMQS shared commitment to health equity and building sustainable solutions to engage groups and communities in the US that have suffered past structural and systemic inequity and or have been simply denied access to clinical research for promising new medicines. This includes a variety of different communities, African, African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic, Latinos, Native Americans, as well as other ethnicities, veterans, people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals, religious groups, and so forth. 
Uh, we, leave it, we believe it is imperative to tap into these communities to give these populations a fair chance in actually benefiting from the treatments they will eventually become the end users of. Um, so that's a little bit of what we'll be diving into today. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Aleshi to provide us with some background on NQS initiative re um, surrounding this collaboration that is on the Alliance for Representative Clinical Trials, again, ARC for short. Go ahead, Dr. Aleshi. And thank you, Christina, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's it's great to be here uh, uh, with with Christina and our friends and partner from Thermo Fisher PPD to uh, talk about the very exciting uh, collaboration and, and unique in its kind. Uh, so, as Christina mentioned, there is really one goal, which is summarized actually in the title of our webinar, which is. Uh, uh, bringing more health equity and democratization in clinical trials by um, putting in place really different element of an infrastructure that uh, is currently missing. Uh, ultimately, that's what ARC and my clinical are to do. So let's look a little bit about what these components are. Um, there is one uh, important element uh, in, in ARC, which it's called the PI Institute. The aim of the PI Institute, where PI stands for Principal Investigator, is to uh, equip um, um, community clinicians. Uh, these are, again, the clinicians that normally are not involved in clinical trial, but they not only they see patients in the community by establishing a very important relation to equip them with the level of training that would empower them to be and serve as a, a principal investigator. And uh, a key component of that is side coach, and you're going to hear uh, in a moment uh, by our partner about this. Uh, so the other important thing is we don't want uh, clinicians to be trained and have to work in a different site. Uh, so the same way that we try to equip the uh, uh, clinicians with, um, with the appropriate training, we also want to equip um, um, you know, community clinics, um, federally qualified community centers with the tools uh, that they need to serve as site for research. And that's another important aspect of this, where we identify again those sites together with the clinician, we do some assessment to make sure that they, um, um, you know, could serve at, at, as site uh, for a clinical trial. And, and, and if not, then we provide some of the resources needed. So uh, through that training process and qualification, then um, you can think about um, some sort of accreditation, right? So then we have uh, trained clinicians and um, equipped site. Then they join a network, which uh, we call My Clinical. And the idea of My Clinical is to provide some sort of one-stop shop where um, we have an infrastructure that uh, allow us to do this in a uniform way. For example, we centralize IB, centralized contract and make sure everything is according to the FDA guidelines uh, and so on. So ultimately that's that's really what the goal is. It's really bringing a trial to the community rather than the other way around, which I think has been uh, the current paradigm uh, paradigm and make sure again that uh, as Christina mentioned, some population that are uh, that have been traditionally un, un, uh, you know underrepresented and underserved, I would say in clinical trial, get the best opportunity without creating barriers, but rather addressing the barriers that they face to participate in clinical <clears throat> trials, which is um, a way for them for uh, of benefiting uh, in terms of access to the most innovative uh, treatment. So that's really in a, in a nutshell what ARC um, and uh, my clinic are trying to accomplish. Thank you, uh, Salvo. Um, so we're going to, going to flip to Lauren and Foster. They're going to give us a little bit of how they are involved in, in this collaboration with their initiative that they have going on and how we merge the two efforts. Hi, thanks. Sorry, I couldn't get off mute for a second. So Lauren Hubbard, um, Director of Patient Diversity at um, PPD Thermo Fisher. I'm very excited to work with NMQF in this space. Um, as uh, Dr. Leshy mentioned, this is something that is um, really important not only to um, 
uh, those that work in health equity, but also on the sponsor side, um, they have now had new mandates from the FDA requiring them to incorporate diversity. Um, and realistically, as a CRO, a clinical research organization, and our role is to support um, these sponsors to achieve those goals, we had to think outside the box. And what that looks like um, is that we understand our role. We are making sure that we want to have the best access to real world patient populations. So ideally working with NMQF in this way to um, really go to the community and access patients where they where they are um, uh, is really important to us. Um, so we're trying to be more proactive, not reactive in our clinical trials as well. We recognize that oftentimes these populations are thought about um, second to last, right? Um, and so how can we make that a forefront thought for our clients? How can we make that a forefront thought for our sites as well? Um, so moving into thinking that way, um, obviously partnerships like this make the most sense. Um, and PPD, Thermo Fisher is definitely, um, we call it all in, but we are, we are all in on how to think through inclusive research, how to think through where to meet our patients as opposed to um, bringing patients to us out of their comfort zone, out of their trust bubble, um, making sure that we are uh, providing resources to not only the sites, but to the, uh, to the patients if we can, um, to make sure that they are capable, enabled, educated, well-informed about clinical trials, to make sure that they feel comfortable with um, all of the different pieces of a clinical trial, all of their visits, all of their tests that they're taking. Um, these are all things that we really strive to work on. So that's a little bit about my team and what we do at PPD. Um, this next slide, um, this is our overall approach. We think about training. I kind of touched on that a little bit. We think about collaborations, um, which is why we're here. Uh, we think about site support, which is another piece of how this collaboration is coming together. We also focus on patient and community engagement. So a lot of these things are tracking for us to, to do this partnership. Um, so we're really excited about the site coach program being leveraged. And I will hand it over to Foster to share more about um, site coach. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate that, Lauren. Um, I am Director of Enterprise Learning for uh, PPD, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I work very closely with Lauren uh, because one of the programs that I manage is one called SiteCoach. And SiteCoach is a program designed to train the staff at research naive sites. And why are we doing this? Well, um, you know, <laughs> through recent research, what we found out is that site staff really struggle with a number of different issues. But uh, as you can see on this slide, the top four issues impacting sites are staff, uh, site staffing and retention, uh, patient recruitment and enrollment, the complexity of the clinical trials that we're currently conducting, and also the startup time that it takes for a study to get active and, and lead towards patient enrollment. And we feel that, um, you know, one of the things that, that we can provide based on our years of experience as a clinical research organization is to leverage the subject matter expertise that we have internally. Um, they've collaborated with my team who are adult learning specialists, and we designed the Psychoach training program. We're really excited that uh, NMQF has been a partner with us and that we've been able to offer this training to uh, several of the sites. So let's go to the next slide, Lauren, and I'll talk about what specifically we address in the Psychoach training program. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, so we developed this uh, training program. It's based on four modules. We provide an introduction to clinical research. So just kind of setting the background of, you know, what is it? What are the key steps? What's grown wrong in the past? What are good uh, clinical practices and why are they important? Uh, we then transition on to uh, focusing on site initiation activities, uh, recruitment strategies, and actually um, getting involved with, with the patient enrollment uh, process. In the third module of the training, we also talk about ongoing trial activities. And so we cover the primary responsibilities of the principal investigator, the sub-PI, co-PI, study coordinators, and other key medical staff that are gonna participate in the study so that they understand exactly what's being expected of them. 
how do they interact with the sponsors, clinical research associates, or clinical trial managers and other key staff from the sponsor? And how do they manage the typical activities, such as how do you prepare for uh, a quality audit? What happens when you have findings and you need to correct those findings? And how do you write SOWs and, and all those kind of detailed activities that if you've never conducted a clinical uh, study before, um, that you'll understand how to do those things and why they're really important. And finally, we wrap up the training talking about how to be uh, an effective trial management team. How do you work together? How do you communicate well together? How do you motivate one another? How do you understand one another's roles and responsibilities so that you can be very effective collaborators? So we've designed this program based on the Joint Task Force for Clinical Trial Competency Framework. So this isn't a program that, that PPD decided that we would put together uh, you know, all by ourselves. It's based on this world organization standards for the conduct of good clinical trials. And so this organization promotes uh, good, good clinical practices, uh, uh, effective trial competencies. We've taken their competency framework and we've put together training that addresses each of those competencies. So optimally, we would start the training uh, before the site initiation so that the team understands what the um, site activities are from uh, feasibility, site activation, all the way to, to site closeout. When we teach the training, it's real time, just like we're doing now. Uh, we don't use Zoom, but we use Microsoft Teams to deliver the training. It's very highly interactive. It's taught by our experienced staff, such as our um, clinical research associates, senior clinical research associates, and others. Um, and it's designed to be very highly engaging. So it's not an opportunity where you can kind of sign on and then multitask and do emails and other things, um, because the instructor or facilitators are constantly engaging with the participants, asking questions, um, conducting um, uh, not research, but like looking at forms and, and templates and, and things like that. Also going through critical thinking exercises. So looking at uh, an informed consent form and figuring out, well, what's wrong with it? How could this be better? What should, can you ask? What shouldn't you ask? Or if you don't collect the right information, what do you do about that? So it's not a passive learning experience where if you were to participate in the training, you, you're not just going to sit there and just have an instructor talk at you all of this time. It's a very engaging experience. And so um, the roles of the staff that particularly uh, that, that typically participate from sites are the, the PI or the Cohen sub-PI, the study coordinator, coordinator, and the other key medical staff, you know, study nurses, uh, pharmacists, and um, uh, maybe even uh, data managers, uh, those types of people. And one of the key benefits um, in addition to this you know, lifelong skill that you can take away after participating in this training is the fact that the training ha content has been recognized by Transcelerate. And so since the training has been recognized by Transcelerate, and if you've fully participated in the training, we can offer you and we'll provide you a certificate of completion. And that certificate can then be used to apply those hours spent in training towards continuing medical education requirements. So it's a really nice um, benefit uh, for going through the training um, to be able to apply those training hours. So what's great about it is that, you know, we, we've trained over 41 sites. We have, have had over 260 participants complete the site coach training at different sites with different sponsors, with different organizations. But specifically with NMQF, we've had six sites trained to date, and we've had 28 participants from these six sites go through their program. And what we're really proud to say is that their feedback is that 100% of the people gone through the training felt that the training was a worthwhile investment of their time. 100% that said that they would recommend the training to others, and 100% said that it, it that it increased their confidence in conducting clinical trials. So we feel like we're on the mark with the content. It's the right kind of content. We take this feedback very seriously. We revise our content to ensure that we have a very positive learner experience. So this training that I've been talking about is the training for research naive sites. 
but we're really excited because my team's partnered with Lauren's team over the past year and a half or so. We've developed two self-paced online training modules that uh, are provided via our learning management system. So if you're interested in this training, you know what we would do is um, we would enable you to have access to our, our, our training system and you would complete uh, the, these two modules. So it's developed for patient-facing staff, um, regardless of your experience level. It um, helps to enhance uh, your inclusive research practices and mitigate barriers that have, that have prevented diverse populations from participating in trials, just like the, this conversation that we're having today. Um, so this is a virtual training again, but it is self-paced. It's about two hours in duration. Currently, it's offered in the United States in English, and um, it can be taken independently or along with, you know, like our research naive training that I just spoke about. But you can see here uh, on, the, on the slide what the topics are. So with that, um, if you've got any questions, feel free to pop those into the chat. We can follow up with you if, if you need more specific information. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, I'm actually gonna hand it over to Christina because I think she has some questions that she wants to ask us. Uh, thanks you two, uh, great slides. So um, we're gonna go into a few questions with our panelists today. And I wanna shoot to Dr. Aleshi first. From your perspective, Dr. What is unique about this collaboration? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, it's, it's truly the first of its kind. I think what um, it's unique, it, it, it really leverage a uh, different type of uh, expertise and, and synergize that. <clears throat> I think it brings on board, um, as, as you could very well see, uh, an extremely well thought out, developed and validated training program uh, with a credibility that also comes with it by, you know, uh, Thermo Fisher PPD being a very well recognized clinical research organization. Uh, at the same time, you also bring, um, you know, NMQF uh, in-depth understanding, not just at the high level, but also from a gr grassroots level and, and, and connection, I guess, with, with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, also that has a communication element in it and an engagement element in it. So I think those are, uh, in my opinion, two of the key ingredients uh, that have been, uh, uh, that make actually this, this organization unique and they are both necessary to build uh, that infrastructure. We need to understand um, and, and know the community that we really want to engage. Um, and I, I think that has been part of the issue that um, I can personally say, I know that different sponsors have, have put a lot of effort into, into that. Uh, but what we are doing here is we are creating a model that um, can further enhance uh, that effort to increase, ultimately translate into the participation that is needed. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. I would totally agree with that. I think that um, PPD as uh, PPD Thermo Fisher as a whole, we really focus on site engagement, how we can better serve sites too. And so I think for us, it's a matter of, we want these new sites to feel encouraged. We want them to actually be able to find studies to, to support and work on. Um, and so for, for my team, that is one of our priorities is making sure that some of these sites that might typically not be incorporated in feasibility because they might be newer to clinical trials or they might, um, just have less experience and sometimes that weeds them out. We want to make sure they feel um, supported and uh, prepared enough and, and know that we have that support to try to highlight them to sponsors to incorporate into our studies. So that's another piece that I think would add to why this is a unique uh, opportunity. Okay, I'll come back to you, Lauren. Um, piggybacking off of that, what do you think the strengths are from PPD Thoma Fisher? I might have just skipped that ahead. <laughs> I think that that's a piece of it is that we do have a dedicated patient diversity team that focuses on how to um, highlight these sites. So I do think that is one of the strengths. I also think that our collaboration, we've been working on this for a while, <laughs> over a year to get here. And so the idea that we have this very strong working uh, relationship is, is another strength um, 
that would be, yeah, I think I, I kind of skipped ahead with the question, but that, that would definitely be what I think are the two strengths on the PPD side. How about you, Salvo? Well, I mean, in a way, I pointed out to that. So I think probably the strength we have is we have the trust of the community. We already have some relation with these community physicians. Um, again, we are very targeting the way we, we reach out uh, to some of these centers and, 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 and physicians. Two ways. One, we really know that um, they have established the relation with the community. They themselves have the trust of the community. Two, we know that these are um, physicians and, and folks, and it's by the way, it's not just physicians, it's also other healthcare professionals, we have nurses and others that uh, truly believe in this and they want to commit their time. Because I think that has been a great challenge. A lot of these community um, physicians have already very busy practice. It's very hard to, um, for them to find any additional time, uh, especially if we have, they have not equipped uh, with the resources of this became a barrier to them as well, because the other issue is you don't want to interfere with the clinical care also they have to do. And, and you heard it very clear loud. Some of these modules, I mean, are so designed to be like very straightforward, um, training be done online at, at your leisure and so on without removing the element of, of being, uh, you know, accredited and, 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 and comprehensive. So I think, uh, yeah, it's that, that relation, that trust with the community. And also the fact that we, as an organization, we just don't want to be the, the middle man. We want to be more of the facilitator uh, and the translator, if you want. Particularly, you know, uh, when we're going to see that there are some issues, some gaps, um, it's not we just bring uh, the trial to uh, the community and then my clinic, and then we step out of it. We will constantly be engaged uh, in, in, in that interaction. Yeah. And that's something that we, uh, as, as an organization just don't have the bandwidth for. So that's why we do connect with groups like NMQF to have that sustained community engagement so that we're not, um, being a barrier that we're not being someone that is, um, deroding, eroding the trust that's already built. And that's really important to us. Uh, research shows that if, you know, you have sustained community engagement, uh, patients are more likely to participate in clinical trials. It's just in the data. So um, that's yep. that's really important to us. Yeah, I'll add to that, that you both mentioned the trust. I think beyond our, before, beyond the Alliance for Representative Clinical Trials and My Clinical, the National Minority Quality Forum has worked years to establish relationships mm -hmm. in the community with these physicians, with these um, sites, um, with these clinics that goes beyond the initiative we have now. So we already have that groundwork, that foundation with these um, physicians and we're able to work with them and they trust us and they are, they believe in what we're doing essentially and they've given us the time to do that. So yeah, trust is important. Um, so Dr. Aleshi, we want to get into a little bit more slight detail in how can community health providers um, get involved in this process with um, the Center for Clinical and Social Research and with ARC and being involved in my clinical and so forth. Yeah, yeah, great, Christina. Again, first of all, like, that's one of the reasons for I'm very pleased about this um, um, you know, this, this, this webinar, and I'm not going to wait until the end for the call of action. I, I actually hope that uh, among the audience here, we have some community providers, some healthcare professionals, even some that have not considered to be involved in clinical trial before, but based on this, I think they will um, realize that there is an opportunity for them to have a greater impact on the community. Uh, so in, in our case, as you also mentioned, Christina, we have leveraged a lot our relation, PPD relations and, and what we know, our own network. But I feel that, um, you know, with now this uh, opportunity and, and learning more, um, you know, I invite everyone that could be uh, feeling interest in, in pursuing this to reach out uh, directly uh, to us. I also should point out that this is, I mean, I, we understand that, uh, this is not a one-off. It's not, you know, and uh, you, you do the training, you complete. And so it, it's more of a long-term commitment. So I, I invite everyone to kind of put that perspective in, in mind, but also just think for a second about the impact they can have on the community. 
uh, about the impact they can also and and in a way how much also then inform their their basic work. Uh, I I keep saying this uh, all the time. I think that uh, uh, clinical trials or clinical research, if you want, in clinical care, it's a continuum. The two shouldn't be separated. is is a little bit artificial. I think that you are a physician. Every physician should be actually uh, involved in clinical trial. Uh, it's not happening enough. Uh, the other thing that I think is going to be important, and perhaps this even goes beyond uh, beyond uh, this initiative, is uh, we we hear a lot uh, that um, uh, people, especially in 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 some of these uh, community, or you know, like like we say, um, people that uh, live in disadvantaged uh, situation with disability, don't hear enough about clinical trial. They are not even kind of made aware of uh, clinical trial every way. So I think that is uh, a call to a clinician. I also want to, um, uh, this is gonna be, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this, is um, uh, you know, build a plane as you fly. I think we mentioned the trust of the community. We mentioned the trust of the doctor. I think we need to also make sure we have the trust of the sponsors. Uh, and uh, I think if we build an infrastructure here, and we put all this effort, uh, that eventually is there and is not utilized or not utilized enough. That's another way as you lose then the trust of the community because uh, ultimately the assumption is, well, this is great, but we don't feel this system is as good enough as going to a traditional academic center. And, and uh, I, so I invite everyone also who may be on this call um, to you know think along those lines, think that here we are building something that is built at a certain level with the same standards that, that we heard here. Uh, in fact, I didn't mention before, but uh, we engaged the FDA from the very beginning, this initiative, uh, the initial uh, support uh, for establishing ARC before even this partnership started uh, came from a grant uh, that involved the FDA. And that's important for people to, to hear. We just don't wanna build something here that is suboptimal. We really want to bring the community on the map with the highest standards. Thank you, Salvo. Um, so Lauren, I'll shoot to you for a quick question. You know, once we have engaged these sites, they've gone through the training, um, how do you, uh, PPD Therm Official, work with the site, if in any capacity at all, once they have begun a trial, once they've been selected to do a trial? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things, right? So before we even get selected for a trial, after they do site coach, we want to make sure that we have all the information possible. So we do a questionnaire, um, making sure that we have, you know, what demographic patient populations they see, what um, kind of like a feasibility, what they have on site, what their what their therapeutic area focuses are, what they're capable of doing at their site. So we have that information so that when sponsors come to us looking for sites, looking for community focused specific sites or community health clinics, we can readily have that information for them. So that's one piece, right? So that they're not kind of in the weeds of the thousands upon thousands of sites that we have in our databases at PPD. We want to highlight those sites um, to make sure that they get incorporated into the standard feasibility process for this for these studies. So that's the first step. And then once that happens, if these um, sites do get selected to move into the study, um, I know that Foster and his team, they have kind of a platform for all the people that have done site coach before. So they kind of have shared share best practices and have that kind of uh, community with other relatively naive site. So that's one piece. They can always also go back to their trainer um, to ask questions, to get guidance. So that's also a really big piece of it. But we don't want them to feel high and dry after they've completed the training. We want to make sure they feel supported throughout those first couple of studies. Um, and then we also make sure to support them as best we can if they need resources or if they need um, better understanding of like, you know, how to, uh, how to, run a study effect effectively, efficiently. Um, studies are challenging. You run into a lot of issues that, you, that you're just not ready for. So we, as PPD, want to make sure we provide them with as many resources as possible to, to combat those. Um, my team is developing a site alliance, which is really a site of, or excuse me, really a collective of um, organically diverse sites so that we can build that community up as well. There's, there's, um, there's a lot of sites out there that are just overlooked 
um, I should say, let me clarify, there are a lot of sites out there that serve underserved, underrepresented communities that are overlooked in clinical trials due to just how we have structured as an industry what we expect, the expectations of these sites, right? We want them to be fast and rolling, want them to be fully resourced, we want them to have all this money. <laughs> and a lot of sites just don't have that. So we wanted to build a community of, of sites who might um who might be challenged in that way, who might not, but they all focused on diverse communities um, so that they can also bounce things off of each other so that we can build KOLs in that space, key opinion leaders in that space. I think that's really important moving forward to acknowledge that um, learning how to work with diverse patients is an actual skill set, is an actual key opinion that we need in our space. So let's help build that too. So there's a couple of things that we're doing um, on our side to just make sure that these sites feel supported, make sure they get these studies. Because I mean, if we want to be completely candid about it, getting studies also means getting revenue from these sites, um, or excuse me, from, from these studies. And, and also just, you know, building this muscle that clinical trials are an option for people that are in, um, uh, in, in underrepresented communities. Um, as as uh, Salvo mentioned, it's not talked about enough. It's not seen as an option. Um, and this, this could definitely change how we think about healthcare overall um, in our communities. So um, I'll stop there because I keep going. This is, you know, I talk about this all day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as Foster mentioned, they have already changed six trains, excuse me, six of our sites. Um, so Salva, I want to ask you if you can go in a little bit about how has this collaboration been piloted thus far? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that that's a, also another, another exciting um, exciting part that we, uh, I, I personally feel there is already significant progress being made uh, in a short, in a relatively short period of time. And we are talking just a year or less. Uh, there are now at least um, there are sites that have been identified at least in, in 11, 11 states from California, Florida to Mississippi, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Georgia. I think I mentioned all of them. <laughs> um, and out of these sites, uh, uh, 10, 10 out of, uh, of the site that we identified complete already feasibility assessment. Uh, we heard about uh, before, uh, you know, um, six have completed site coach and so on. Um, and, and we are more uh, approaching more and more of these, uh, both in terms of, in, you know, uh, clinicians and um, uh, inside uh, to expand the network. At the same time, we are piloting the network. As we speak, we have one particular trial that is going on. Um, um, in a, and it involves two sites. This is a trial that is focused on uh, early screening of, of colon cancer. Uh, and, um, um, and, and we start enrolling. So we are kind of uh, not just building the network, but we are piloting and we uh, pretty much are, um, um, are uh, you know, at, at least some of the sites are already operational and ready to go. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, we uh, need more trials already uh, for some of the sites that have been identified because I truly believe that uh, if we don't start really um, kind of collecting information and see how these things go and so on, uh, then it's going to be hard, you know, to get some more learning that we can then f incorporate in fine tuning the program. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of progress being made, of course, a long way to go. Uh, but but uh, I also wanted to point out uh, again, that's why I mentioned we build the plane uh, as we fly, you know, uh, but there is a lot of activity already going on. Thank you. So we want to do a little bit of foreshadowing. Where do you think this collaboration will be in the next year? or so time, or even in the next five years? And Dr. Alessia, I'll start with you. Uh, in the next year, right, that's, uh, in, so I, I would think that, uh, I, I mean, I, I would like to have uh, uh, all of the sites uh, that we have, at least uh, completing um, uh, the appropriate uh, feasibility assessment. And, and, and at least, I mean, we have a goal. Uh, we had a goal by the end of the year to identify 15 um, you know, potential principal investigator, 15 sites. Um, I, I would think that we can meet the goal you know, um, by the end of the year, if not being beginning of next year. That is already an important goal because these start feeling as a network. Um, so I also think that um, uh, I, I would like to see in, in the next year 
uh, perhaps a couple more trials being secure. And again, these don't have to be necessarily the interventional trial, but uh, they would allow us again to, to, to test, test the water here, but actually also um, understand what some of the challenges can be. Uh, and, um, and, and actually also be, uh, I think it's also a way uh, for uh, the community, not just for the sponsors of the trial, uh, to, to see that there is some action and that they can be part of, 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 uh, of this initiative. So I think that I would like, I mean, I mentioned one trial, I would like to have a few more, uh, where I kind of uh, see this going in, in five years from now. Um, I, I would really like uh, to see in five years a network that is um, very well fleshed out. Uh, I would like to uh, see a network that is adopted um, consistently. In fact, I would like this model in five years to be seen, seen as, as sort of the gold standard uh, of what's, um, uh, what's needed. And, and I would like to see some of these metrics overall improving uh, because I, I think I, I was... Uh, um, I think it's important that uh, we have guidance now. In fact, we have Monday by the FDA uh, to increase diversity in clinical trial. But again, uh, if this becomes a barrier to also sponsor, ultimately, it's not going to help anyone uh, because it, 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 it ultimately will not um, uh, translate into any value uh, for, for, for the community to start with uh, or anyone else. So I think uh, in five years, I'm not expecting we're gonna go to solve the problem, but I'm gonna see, I would like to see for every trial that we conduct to this network, showing that there is a substantial uh, substantial difference in the uh, percentage of diversity. And this will vary, depends on the trial, right? Because ultimately this thing should be based on also on science, on the prevalence of the disease and so on. But we're gonna see the needle moving towards the right direction at the right speed. Because for me, that's, that's the issue. Um, I mean, we should be uh, very honest here. There has been improvement being made, but it's the speed also at which um, this um, is being ad adopted uh, that, is, um, that is a little bit frustrating to all. What's your vision, Lauren? Um, yeah, I think I, I'm very, I'm very much aligned with Salvo's vision. I think that in the next year or so, we would just love to see more sites um, joining ARC and my clinical and um, being trained and being able to access studies. Um, so that's really, you know, our, our main focus right now for the next year is how do we ensure that um, we can get these sites trained and actually find studies for them. So that's our that's our first goal. I think moving into like five years, three years, I do want to see um, uh, community health clinics, uh, FQHCs, um, those types of sites be more regularly incorporated into strategies um, for for site uh, enrollment for study enrollment. Um, and I think that's obviously like we we all know that the FDA guidance is going to have some some impact on that. And so I, I know we'll definitely see that in the next three to five years. And so for me, I think the goal is um, making sure that we're ahead of that curve. <laughs> you know, it's like making sure that we were ready and prepared, making sure that we have the sites um, trained and ready to go um, for that for that big rush. And it's already happening, to be honest with you. Sites, um, excuse me, sponsors are already asking for these types of sites regularly. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're leveraging this relationship to, to, to support that. Um, so I'm just hoping for more of that in that it's not as, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not just a, a, a accident that these FQHCs or that these health clinics are, are making it into these studies, right. Or that they're not thought about secondhand when we're not meeting our, demographic goals for the study and then there's like there's this panic and then they have to find these sites um you know that's what I'm trying to avoid so I, I'm hoping that that changes in the next three to five years yes I agree with that more of them becoming the rule and no longer the exception exactly not thank you those, those are the words I was looking for thank you <laughs> exactly right yep okay so we want to thank you all for you know, your Q&A that you've been putting in the box thus far. Um, I see Foster has been working diligently answering a few of those. Um, I hope our panelists are able to view them, but I'm going to read a couple of them out loud 
and hopefully we have the tools and to respond. And if not, we will get back to you all on some of your questions. Um, so it looks like someone here is trying to perhaps to present themselves as a clinic. Do you want us to participate in this clinical trial since we have many underserved patients? What is the process and benefits to the clinic? Um, so I think we can attack the latter portion of that. If you are interested in uh, participating and becoming a part of the network, um, you can reach out to us and we can give you the step-by-step -step process of that. Um, and we'll go and we'll be able to go into that into more detail. It's nothing explicit or extensive, but you know, we'll be able to connect one-on-one -on -one and go into that more. Um, the process and benefits to the clinic, um, I think. The idea of having the network is so we're able to guide the site themselves. We're able to work with them. We understand the burden is not necessarily a lack of interest in research. It's more so a lack of time and a lack of personnel, a lack of staff that we've come across with these different community clinics and federally qualified health centers. Um, and where NMQF comes in and where PPD comes in is we're here to kind of hold your hand and guide you helps assess your infrastructure, see what you need, see what you have, see how we can help improve and guide you along that way. We don't do the site coach and leave you alone. We don't do the introductions to the sponsor and leave you alone. We're there the whole time. We are serving as a center, a central coordinating center. So we help throughout the whole process from startup to close out, um, from site selection to close out. And the two to five years or so where you're even on reserve with the sponsor of keeping, you know, your folders and files on in your clinic. So we're there the whole way to help guide you along. Um, there's also the benefit of revenue. Um, I know we didn't really get to touch on that, but there is significant revenue that can be made and can help us with the deficit that some of these community clinics and fairly qualified health centers, health centers experience, you're able to bring that money in and redistribute it, redistribute it as needed. Um, so that's the benefit as well. And there's much more beyond that. Can I just add to you? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I wanted to kind of make a comment exactly because I think and we all think it's kind of probably implicit, but it's good to bring it up. I think that what Christina says is important. It's not just the, um, if, if you want the revenue benefit or financial benefit, as we call it, to the clinic, it's to the community. This ultimately is money that is invested in the community. And that's the way it should be. You know, that's why I keep saying, bringing the trial to the community rather than the other way around, right? Uh, it's different if you are a participant, has to fly to a very well-funded research institute um, and you contribute your time, your participation and so on, but you still get benefit as an individual for participating in the trial. Um, you get a lot of benefit um, if you are able to even do that. But there is not the level of impact in the community. So I like to emphasize that part that the community aspect is central to this initiative. Um, and that goes all the way to, again, identify the clinic, uh, the personnel, uh, some of the uh, folks that hire family member of people that need to go in the clinical trial. And that, that is important, right? Um, and, and the involvement also of uh, other organizations, churches, and, and so on, to help like kind of educate as well as, as engage. So that investment is not just uh, to the benefit of the clinic, uh, but to the benefit of our uh, community. And, and also, I think, in a way, amplify uh, the impact that the clinic and the physician has on, on the community. I was literally, I was going to say very similar <laughs> to that. It's, it is a huge benefit to um, the patient and their family. Um, you know, many of the trials are leveraging or, or you know, um, very top of the line technologies to monitor your health, period, right? So, um, and, and that's not something that we typically have um, that is free of cost for the most part to the patient. Um, so that's another benefit just for the patient and their family, I think, too, that we do often overlook with clinical trials. We think more on the lines of like, oh, they're going to, you know, give me this um, experimental drug. And that is true, but they will also monitor you nonstop 
Um, and right. sometimes identify other health concerns that you might not have been aware of because you're being monitored nonstop. Um, and they are very concerned about your health. They are very concerned about your well-being in these studies. So I think that that's a huge piece of it too, that there's just access to more unique, specific care when you're a part of a um, clinical trial um, that, that we often overlook. Thank you. Um, our next question, I don't, can you describe how the consolidate, consolidated standards of reporting trials, artificial intelligence can support clinical trial diversity? Uh, is, I, I don't I actually not familiar, so I can't speak. I, to I, uh, I, I, I just, um, perhaps I can ask, answer the question a little bit broader. I mean, I'm a big fan of actually applying artificial intelligence um, to clinical trial. In fact, uh, within an, an MQF, we had had just some recent discussion. In fact, up until yesterday, we were in meeting some of us about how to help uh, uh, using uh, artificial intelligence together with the data we the to really help predict outcomes. I think the way the artificial intelligence could help in this context is, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, it, it being even more accurate in uh, uh, matching uh, the people to the trial. Um, for example, um, assessment of, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, of the fact, and I think that's another important point I was trying to make of uh, the fact that if you perhaps are more flexible with certain inclusion exclusion criteria, the number of participants can be higher, which is a broader question. And, and AI can pretty much model that and, and so on. Um, I think uh, AI also can be applied to some of the tools uh, that you perhaps I should have mentioned this maybe in, in our previous question, not to digress. Is I think a lot of the things that can be done today in the context of uh, clinical trials, especially in the initial phase, uh, can be done at the at the patient home, right? So we are talking about side, but I, I think, uh, and this will depend on the trial. One thing that we'll try to promote is a lot of these initial screening and things being done uh, when it's feasible and, and, and suitable at home, even some of the follow-up, reducing the number of side visits. I think it's already a way to reduce barriers, especially in this uh, Further fine tune matching people to trial can increase the predictability, uh, can give a, a, as a, in a kind of uh, a evaluation, uh, for example, of uh, um, in the future, hopefully, uh, what uh, uh, maybe the likelihood also of experiencing side effect or other things from a drug would be. Um, so I think the issue is broader than diversity in clinical trial, but can also help with some of the things that we are doing. Thank you. Um, I think I'll take one more. How are sponsors evolving their criteria for site selection to comply with FDA on clinical trial diversity? And how does this program intersect with that evolution? Maybe kind of touched on this, but if you had you two had any to add. I mean, it's directly aligned. Um, so sponsors, I would say, are definitely asking us as CROs. Um, you know, more often than not, where these diverse patient populations are, how we can access them, what are the sites that have, you know, better experience with them. So um, realistically, it's us modifying because of these requests. Um, and it's still a work in progress. I think each client or excuse me, sponsor that we've been working with has different metrics or different expectations of what they want from these sites. So we're just making sure that we have all that information from the sites to be able to provide as soon as possible. This is another reason why this collaboration is so important right now because um, we can't find those sites all on our own. That's why we need trustworthy, established, um, community-focused organizations like NMQF to kind of step in and fill that gap for us um, in a way. and. Um, I don't think that um, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. Obviously, so it's going to be a continued work in progress for us to make sure that that's streamlined as effective as possible. But I will say that sponsors are definitely um, asking the right questions, and it's up to us. I, I I think it is on the CRO part to make sure that we're providing 
the the right sites to them. And so we're working on the back end on, on for us with our feasibility team very, very closely to ensure that our metrics and our algorithms are in um I, I was gonna say improved, but that's true, improved and and modified to make sure that these sites aren't getting um left on the bottom of the list. So I think uh boy, what I would add maybe from the angle where I'm coming from and I was kind of uh, pointing to that earlier in the discussion. Um, I think this is a, 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 and you say it very well, actually, it, it is a continuous dialogue that has to evolve. Um, uh, so this is the beginning of, of that uh, evolution. It's not the end. And the mind, you know, the I think the uh, mindset shift started, but it takes adoption. That's why I say when we are in five years, I hope this is going to be adopted as gold standard. Yeah. Uh, it takes time. Um, same way that I guess you have the relationship with the sponsor, we have it in another way, but we also have a great relation with the FDA. And I think that's also a role that the NMQF can play very well because uh, we are not a, a private organization. You know, uh, when we communicate with the, uh, uh, to the FDA, we uh, pretty much, um, you know, clearly cannot be perceived as serving one particular entity interest, but really serving the community. And as we are building this network, Actually, I would say on a monthly basis, uh, we have interaction with, with the FDA to keep them appraised of uh, the thing that we are doing, the progress that we are making, and also um, hearing their thoughts and their feedback and having that exchange incorporated into uh, process, procedures, and, and so on. And, and I think so that, uh, you know, that, that's going to be important. You want to have everyone on the same page. Uh, but again, as you pointed out, this is not something that can happen tomorrow, uh, but it shouldn't take a decade, another decade. Right. I mean, uh, one thing that I always cite this, I, I, I cited that before, you know, on some blogs, I say, I, I remember when, you know, um, we started I mean campaign with NMQF and it set in motion, I guess, a lot of what's happening now, but it took almost a decade, more than a decade, bro. we can't wait another decade for this uh, to happen. I guess we are a very important inflection point, um, but also we have to be realistic in our expectation. Uh, we, we, you know, we can't, uh, uh, whatever, half, uh, you know, the challenge of the diversity participation clinical trial by next year, it's not gonna happen simply. Um, but also that effort has to be constant. And, um, and you know, like in anything, you have to, um, uh, you have to experiment a little bit right with things and learn as you go totally this is new for everybody this is new for our sponsors cro's and sites this new priority is definitely going to be an evolving um situation that i'm really excited to honestly be a part of the the beginning steps with nmqf and and working towards finding real solutions for for patients yes okay so we're coming up on two minutes left to our webinar um, any last quick last thoughts? I am going to put my email in the chat for everyone who would like to reach out who are interested. We did have a couple people asking about their organizations or how to, they can do a feasibility or become a clinic. Um, so I'll put that in there. But any final thoughts from our panelists? Um, I will just say from, from our perspective, um, if you are interested and you're working with NMQF, um, please fill out the questionnaire. Please complete the questionnaire fully. If you are a health uh, center out there, or a community focused site out there, um, because that is the data we need to support you all. Um, and also, you know, obviously another plug for, for Foster and his team doing great work um, with Site Coach and um, the feedback speaks for itself. So we are really excited to be able to engage and educate more sites around clinical trials and, and supporting them in that way. So um, that would be my two, my two, I, you didn't ask for call to action, you asked for last thoughts, but those are my two call of actions is, um, you know, if you are a site that's interested, please fill out the question so we can have all the data possible to make sure that we are presenting you in the best light to the sponsor and please uh, do site coach it's worthwhile yeah no nothing much to well I already have my call to actions I guess earlier on <laughs> because I know we could be running out of time so to me this it's all about participatory health it's community health and so on so my call to action is um, is very simple no matter where you sit today, uh, where you are in, in this, um, uh, for those of you attending this seminar, play your part. 
this could be simply, you know, um, talking at dinner about someone that you feel may be interested or that you know uh, about this. Um, uh, connect with us, but also, quite frankly, sh share your thought and criticism. I think that's always something that uh, it, it's always hard to ask for, right? Uh, but uh, we put a lot of thinking into this, um, um, you know, and uh, of course, um, I, I think we are making qu quite significant progress. Uh, but uh, sometimes some, there are some great ideas that has to be concrete that come up from outside, right? So, yeah. um, and, and so feel free to, of course, engage with us, um, hopefully, you know, to increase participation if you are a, a PI or a clinics. But don't be afraid also if you don't belong to any healthcare professional or so on, and especially if you have a patient. You know, sometimes what I learned, the great idea come up from, from the people actually that, uh, that, that are facing a challenge with the disease. And there can always be something that we can incorporate uh, in our program uh, to make it more meaningful. So that's, uh, that's probably as far as I would go. Okay. I want to say thank you to all our panelists. Thank you for everyone who attended. Again, I left my email in the chat for everyone who would like to reach out with any additional questions or clarification who are interested, whether sponsor or site or so forth. Um, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great weekend.